welcome to the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright and Joris Peels. Hello everyone, my name is Joris Peels and this is another episode of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright. Hey Brent, how are you doing? Hey Joris, yeah, it's uh, it's good to be on. I'm, I'm really excited about this one uh, today, so this is going to be a fun one. Okay, cool, cool. So who do we have? So we got Paul Macy from Macy O&P. And uh, the neat thing about Paul is he's been around the block a time or two in orthotics and prosthetics. But he also, not only is a certified prosthetist and orthotist, but he also has a master's in mechanical engineering from Boston University. So pretty wild combination. And I tell you what, he's creating some just amazing devices in the 3D printing space as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing kind of his journey, a little bit of the philosophy, and then I'm sure we'll have a few rabbit trails from, you know, here and there. All right. Welcome to the show, uh, Paul. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And and thanks for inviting me. You guys are doing a great job with these podcasts. They're really pretty fun to, to listen to. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, So first off, how did you get started in OMP? How did you get into this world? Well, I probably have uh, a background that many clinicians have or may not have. That's kind of the cool thing about our field, I think, is that people come from all over the place, right? So I graduated from college and then I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went to work for a little bit and then I went back to graduate school. I was interested in engineering, but kind of maybe didn't realize that as an undergrad, went into engineering and graduated and then got my master's in mechanical engineering and kind of went to working on helicopters that they make, blades and turbines and all kinds of stuff, and enjoyed that. But then I just sort of fell into the program in Newington, went to the Newington Certificate Program because I was looking for a change. I enjoyed engineering, but I wanted to work with people more and not just sort of drawings or the CAD work that I was doing there. And my wife actually worked at Newington's Hospital, which at that time had the certificate program. So I was like one of the, I think I was the second year there and did that. And then I went to work for Newington and then Newington was bought by Hanger. And then I worked for, I was practice manager for Hanger for 10 years. And then, then I worked for another company for 10 years. And then I started the practice that we have now. So it's kind of a roundabout route, I guess. Well, we're finding that that everyone kind of takes a roundabout route. I mean, there's very, I mean, uh, everybody kind of takes a roundabout route to get here. I think it's it's a, it's a take, and this industry is super diverse in terms of the type of people that work there and the backgrounds they have and and the reasons they have for joining it and all that kind of stuff. Well, I think that's true. I mean, and and I think I think that that is a really good thing because people come into this field with all kinds of different perspectives and talents and. You know, um, that that's what's kind of amazing about, I think, the people that we work with and our co-workers and, and our, you know, different companies that provide the services to these patients. I mean, you know, it, it's a value to the patients when clinicians come in, I think, with lots of different experiences. So it's a good thing. Yeah. And, and well, what did you find? And, uh, we do also notice that if there's one commonality, there's a lot of people that li- like that are rather concrete, kind of like to do things with their hands or like to make stuff or like to be involved in something that's actually like, you know, very, very physical or very, very real as opposed to like, you know, giving PowerPoint presentations all day. Is that, is that kind of something that, that, that typifies you as well? Or Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, enjoy the hands-on work. And I, and I, I like the fact that everything we do is different. So, you know, I, I remember 30 years ago, I would be working on a mold in engineering and, you know, y- you could work on a part or a part of the assembly line or something for years. You know, you could be working on the same sort of thing for, you know, many years optimizing it and whatnot. But the beauty of our field is that we are constantly working on you know, a new patient, whatever new patient sort of walks in the doors. That's one of the things that attracted me, um, attracted me to the field. So I think that's for me anyway, that's, that's just really exciting because I mean, I, I don't really think you can say that this job gets boring. 
So, Paul, you know, one of the neat things that I've seen kind of you do, not only is it really adopt this digital technology, but it seems like your, your practice is growing, too. Can you share just a little bit about kind of your philosophy and, and how not only are you, you getting people kind of in the door and f- helping them fall in love with the prosthetic and orthotic industry, but then what is your philosophy as far as moving them into the digital space? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, when I, when I left the company I, I was at last, what, one of the things that, that I wanted to do was to sort of apply technology in a much more pervasive way in a practice. So I really wanted to invest in the technology and I had a ton of background. I mean, I've worked in CAD for 30 plus years or more. I mean, I had already worked in CAD in my previous companies, but I, but I only was really working a little bit in CAD because I couldn't control the funding and the investment decisions and those types of things. I remember way back when, I mean, it was years ago, but the first program that I ever remember was this 3D printing system called Squirt Shape. I don't know, Brett, if you ever remember that thing, but I remember yeah, that was like, sure. yeah, it was 20 years ago or whenever it was. You could 3D print a socket way back when. And the machine cost, I don't even know, half a million or something. And it would take five days to print a socket or whatever. But I remember thinking way back then, well, you know, this all, th- this is fantastic. Like this all makes sense. This is exactly what I wanted to do. 20 years later, I think the technologies have become available to all of us where we can do that. So I guess to answer your question, I kind of set out to create create that system or create the way to to treat patients and try and really utilize CAD at a much more in-depth sort of way than I was able to do it previously. So we basically invested quite a bit of money to learn how to do all of these processes. And it just kind of took off. I, I think I, I think the younger generation of clinicians certainly is very excited about concept of CAD and, and, and there's all kinds of buzz about it right now. So it lends itself well to new students who are far more intelligent than, than I ever was and that, and that many people are. They seem to get smarter every year. So I feel like it's sort of a natural thing that needs to come into our field. And, and, and so when we started the company, what we came up with was a motto that, that is essentially custom care with you in mind. So the symbol is a snowflake. So my mother used to always say, everyone is a snowflake, you know, no, no two are alike. And I really feel like we do that every day, but for us, the ability to utilize CAD to sort of create specific designs for people in a different way lends itself beautifully to that. I remember when I was first learning, the guy that was modifying the mold would say, okay, we'll just take that down a skosh. And I, I said, what? And he said, <laughs> he kind of held up his fingers and they were an eighth inch apart. He said, skosh. So what's a skosh? He said, so I didn't know the term. And he said, that much. I said, okay. And so I, I whittled away at the mold, what I thought was a skosh, but my my point is, I just love the idea of in CAD knowing exactly what you're doing and when, and then having it sort of be repeatable. But then, and I think yeah. that people like that too when they when they sort of see what we're doing. Yeah, but then if you've been involved in CAD a long time, you've been involved in CAD when it was like horribly slow and terrible, <laughs> and and you know a lot has changed right over that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we used to, I learned on ShapeMaker, at least in this field, although I had done more sophisticated CAD programs, but, but I sort of, I set out to really try and utilize what I knew from an engineering perspective and look beyond O&P CAD systems, nothing against the CAD systems that exist in our field, but I really wanted to dive into it quite a bit deeper. So we invested in some engineering programs like Freeform and others where uh, 
where I think the CAD systems that are available to us now today are just far greater than than what they were in addition to obviously the 3D printers, which is a whole disrupting sort of evolution that's happened in the past five years. So, so there's a lot more available to us, I think. Can, can you talk a little bit about your journey? <clears throat> Cause your magic freeform wasn't your first, your first rodeo, right? So how, how did you land on, on that? I mean, you talk about a little bit of freedom and design and creativity and all that, but can you just share with, our audience that may be looking for options, why you chose the route that you did? Well, at the time, this is six years ago or so, I just had done a bunch of research. I had researched all the available O&P CAD packages and then also looked at engineering packages that were available. One of the things about our field is that it is forever that combination of Beautiful precision associated with a modification that you can either do by hand or by CAD coupled with art. Freeform itself has a, has a, has a haptic device where you can actually use this device to quote unquote feel the mold on the screen in CAD. So when I tried this system, I was just sort of blown away and I thought, okay, well, this This makes sense to me. This is just an extension of my hands on a rasp with a, with a plaster BK mold in front of me where I'm whittling away material. It just sort of made sense to me from my experience. So I just kind of, at that time, took the plunge. I I mean, I literally just invested in it and just at that time, there, there Nobody was doing it. And so I just taught myself because I had, I had the experience. So it, it turned out to be a really good decision f- for us, for me. I mean, maybe not for everyone, but, but for me, that program just fit with what I wanted to do. I mean, the program itself was very often used for modeling clay and, and sort of doing work where when I think clay, I think plaster, I think there's similarities there. So it just sort of was a nice merge for, for what we were doing. But I did not have at the time anyone out there doing it. So I couldn't say, okay, well, this, you know, this is obviously being used by anyone else. Maybe you were doing it, Brett, at that, I don't know, but I just kind of fell into it and learned it. So it's, it's worked out quite well. That's, that's really neat. And I don't, I mean, what year was that when you when you started? Well, it was six years ago, five years ago, that I started with that software. 2017, yeah. 2018, something like that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We probably, it was probably about the same time. Boy, just, I would have learned a lot faster if I would have hooked up with you, that's for sure. <laughs> same here. I mean, I, honestly, I found out that you were doing stuff when you started posting. I was like, wait a minute. Somebody else is doing this and they're CPO. This is unbelievable. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And I know there are others now out there using this program as well. And, and what's your workflow like? Does it differ a lot per prosthesis, per, per, per device? or? Well, we, we basically scan the limb, the residual limb, and we, we bring the scan in to the CAD system. And then we modify. So... Everyone has different opinions on scanners and programs and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I personally see a ton of value in in scanning, bringing the scan in, and, and we modify the mold from there using the software. And and we do that together. So so I become, you know, very proficient in freeform, and now I am extending that knowledge to the clinicians that that work at our company. And so we often will modify together. So we spend probably more time than most companies on that part of the workflow, on the actual modification of the mold, and not a ton of time. It's just we spend a lot of time doing that uh, for good reason, because I believe in it. I, I, I personally believe that CPOs are trained to modify their own their own devices. So be that an AFO or a BK or an AK, that's something that 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 we should be doing. And 
not, you know, many places in our field, I think that that doesn't happen, right? I mean, you, you, you take an AFO cast and you put it in a box and you send it out. Well, we, we do that sometimes for some of our things, but for a lot, we don't, we, we modify it specifically and then maybe send it out to be fabricated or we design it ourselves and send it out to be printed. But I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I personally feel that one of the one of the goals that we've always had was that we want to be able to modify. So we feel that that there's ownership there, right? So if if the clinician is modifying 100% of their socket or uh, aware of every aspect of it, that that's how you learn, right? So so by the clinician modifying it. They know how it fits and they know exactly what they need to change. And it's just something that is, I think, obvious, but I think in our field, it often may not happen. And I, lo- I love that. And yours, just, just, just to give you an idea, I mean, the, most of the time or a lot of the times, this idea of centralized fabrication happens where you will send your work to somebody else and they end up doing it. So there's also central fabrication as far as the actual making of the device, but there's also central design where you may actually send a device out that is modified by somebody else, which is a, is an interesting model as well. I think one thing that's neat about Paul though, and I think for our field in general is you have to know what the cause and effect is on what you do. So if you if you modify something and you modify it wrong and it doesn't fit, it's on you. So there's an old joke kind of in our field, like if you make a device and it doesn't fit, you can blame it on the technician, right? It's not your fault. But if if your hands are in it and you are the one making the device, then it becomes your fault. And so there's a lot of accountability and responsibility for that. And I think it also places a a more importance on the clinical idea of this is the device, the prescription, right? The, The type of device that I'm going to make for the patient. And then we're also going to fit the device. And so that combination is, is super important. This idea of fitting what you've made is really foundational to the orthotic and prosthetic world. And I think a lot of other companies miss out on some of that. Now, just like Paul said, there are some times that you can send out your device and you get something back and you fit it and it, and it works out okay. But there is a sense of, for some of these devices, that you need to be hands-on. It needs to be all hands on deck to, to fit appropriately. And I think some of the software companies and such forget about the role of the clinician in all of this. And I think just stepping back for those companies and, and those that are listening to this podcast, the, the companies, is don't forget that on the backside, a clinician has to fit these devices, and it's important for them to interact with it. The more that a clinician can interact with software or the fabrication side of things, the more skin they have in the game. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Accountability and just sort of ownership of what you're delivering is absolutely massive. And I, and I, and I truly feel that, that this process that we've created for our K's, AKs, AFOs, and other lots of other devices that we do allows us that in a much more sophisticated way. Now, can a clinician who has a great relationship with a technician in his office in a lab come out with unbelievably fantastic outcomes? Absolutely. That's that's absolutely true. And so I would never get into, oh, anyone can decide whose socket fits better. No, that's not the point. I, what I'm trying to do is is create something whereby we know what we delivered, we own it, and if we screw it up, it's my fault. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I'd much rather have it be my fault or the concept of un, 
packing the box and taking the leg out and just looking at it and saying, that doesn't look like my alignment. I, I don't know. And, and I know that when, when we take stuff out of the box because we outsource the 3D printing of our definitive sockets and stuff, that my alignment and my socket fit is exact, like to 0. 0.00001, whatever. So for me, it's, it's just taking those sort of doubts out of the process and just making it more efficient. So kind of a, I'm kind of addicted to that. And the process for me, I just, I couldn't, I personally could never practice any other way, having sort of done it successfully this way. And, and that said too, when you go ahead and fit something that I've designed in CAD, sometimes we blow it, right? It doesn't fit that well. And that's okay because I can go right in on CAD and then look at my overlays and modify it the way I should have modified it and remake something, but not have to start over. So I have the whole history of it. So just, just my engineering brain and, and the efficiency of that just, just seem to, to make sense. But then the corollary, corollary is, of course, that you maybe are less profitable or less efficient than other businesses. Or do, do you think that that's it? Well, it, it definitely seems it's a trade off you're willing to make. But I think a lot of people listening to this are thinking that's that's a great idea philosophically, but it's much faster and cheaper for me to outsource, and it'll you know nobody will notice in the end, kind of thing, right? Yep, absolutely. And and that's where everybody has to make make their own decisions and so forth. I I, I think. At this point, with the insurance companies dictating lower reimbursements and so forth, coupled with costs going up. So just recently last week, I mean, I got the, what was it, the the 10% increase by OSER and the six or whatever increase to Autobot. Prices that we have to pay are going up, so our costs are going up. So I feel like we can't control our reimbursement necessarily, right? I mean, it is what it is, depending on your contracts and so forth. And our costs of goods are going up. So, you know, that that squeeze play is not sustainable. So at some point, I just feel like we have to try some new things, right? I mean, I feel like that was the point of our company. It was like, okay, let's let's create something where perhaps we can save on overhead in one place, which is more of a savings than the increases that we're having in others. And I think that's a good point. And, and to your point, yours, I think it becomes a, a relationship with whoever you're doing contract manufacturing with. But I think what Paul is kind of speaking to is controlling what you can control. And one of the things that you can control is uh, your fit of your device. And so if you're able to control that and it takes you less time in the end, say if, unless you sent something out to a contract manufacturer and you get it something next day and you don't have any skin in the game but it takes you an hour to fit it because it's not quite the way that you would do it whereas it would be a, a 15 minute appointment if you had done it and done it in house is is it worth the trade off of your time which you can control is now being taken up because it takes a little bit longer to fit or fix something that wasn't translated quite right in the final device. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think, you know, it's like anything too, where, you know, of, of course you're going to have some sort of redos in the beginning and all that. But I mean, I, we know what we know, right? I mean, everybody knows how their companies work and so forth. And honestly, we have little to no redos. So our redo cost is very, very low. And we, and that's because we've gotten very comfortable with what we can do with CAD and how we can fit things. We're not perfect, but I just know from a business perspective, I am the one that pays the bills and that we don't, we're not remaking or redoing things. We've really gotten it down quite well where things can get delivered in a very confident way and, and not have to spend money on redoing something or following up. It doesn't mean we want to, don't want to see the patients. Obviously, we want to follow up, but we're not having to do a whole lot of time involved post-delivery. Yeah. 
Well, and just to give you an example, though, and this kind of drives the point home for me, what you're saying is efficiency of the time, time that you can control. I actually had a company reach out to me and said, hey, man, I'll, we'll, we'll print some things for free for you just so we can kind of figure out workflow. And I said, that, that's great. I love getting things for free. But here's some of the things that you have to think about. My time going in there, seeing, evaluating if the technology works or doesn't work. Or on top of that, I have to do double work so I can have one that I know works along with this free device that I'm not going to get reimbursed for. It may take me longer. It may cost me an extra trip. It really causes me pause on what kind of technology I want to work with and then invest on what I know is currently working. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you can, you can always get sort of something uh, quick and maybe for free up front, but really it's, it's your processes that, that matter. The, the other thing I just wanted to bring up, if, if I may, is that we don't, I won't modify anything without measurements, so without the clinician. So there's, um, there's the concept of the clinical evaluation which is everything that they teach in all of the, you know, the great OMP schools out there, all of that is incredibly valuable. So the concept of modifying something, I, we, I won't do it if we don't have circumferences and MLs and all of those, all of that clinical evaluation up front, it doesn't go away with CAD. So all of the, you know, in, in our opinion, all of the, the fears about just, engineering companies coming in and disrupting our field, I feel very confident that, that, you know, that that's not something that can happen today anyway, because you still have to know what you're doing as a CPO during the evaluation to then design it and modify it appropriately. Otherwise you have the same, the same errors. So. Yeah, and what do you do? And, and you manage to, okay, make sockets or 3D printing. How does that work? Do you do that yourself? Do you outsource that? What, what do you exactly do with additive or 3D printing? Well, we, we modify the mold. So the first step is the data acquisition, the scanning. Second part is the CAD, where we actually design the mold. So that's, that's the same concept as the filling the cast and, and then modifying with a sure form or whatever um, you're doing. And then from there, we then create the 3D printed sockets. We first create a check socket if it's a BK. We print those in-house and we have our alignment and everything sort of locked in, the angles and everything, which again come from the clinician. I don't do them. So the you know, the clinicians tell me, you know, what the angles of the socket should be and where the pyramid should be underneath. So they're fully invested in what they're fitting. So then, then we, we iterate through a check socket or two or three or whatever we need to do. And then we go to uh, the final socket, which we design. So we design the flexible inner and the frames and the whole thing. And for us, we, we have that outsourced. So we don't have one of those expensive HP printers in house. We have someone else do that. And the same is true for the AFOs. We outsource that. And and what's it like working with an outsource partner? Because you control everything else. That must have been really scary in the beginning. Is it, oh, I need to now rely on someone all the time. Was that difficult for you? or Not really. I certainly have been in the field over 27 years or whatever. So I'm used to having someone else make something. It's just, it's just in this case, they were they were making... Um, the thing that I designed. For me personally, I feel like I am doing my own fabrication. So so it's the same thing as when I used to laminate sockets or whatever. I, I was making it myself. Those always fit the best. Not to sound whatever, but <laughs> the ones that I made, I always felt were kind of perfect because I had my hands in everything. So So when I design the socket, I feel like I'm fabricating the device in my brain, which I love because I can be creative with it. I love the creativity of the CAD and the, the reliefs. And I knew in my head that this person had a fibular head, for example, that moved around. So I wanted to make the pocket a little bigger. All those things, I, that's what gets me really excited about it. So I can dial in exactly 
and then I'm fabricating it virtually. My jig is a virtual. It's a virtual jig. So I fabricate the thing. I mean, I'm just sending an email to a guy who's pressing print, essentially. So the stresses involved in opening the box when I get the thing back are actually far less than anything I've ever experienced. I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but it's, well, it's what us, excites me. Take us a little bit on the kind of the journey on, on, on like just for our listeners that, you know, that don't know that other contract manufacturers are available, that they don't, you know, have to buy and a very expensive machine. So I want to hear about you kind of your journey, kind of finding your, your person or, or people. But then I also want to hear, you know, uh, and I know you have, I talked to it doesn't always go as planned, right? Uh, machines go down, multiple machines go down, all that stuff. So how, you know, we want to get, we want to paint a very positive, but realistic picture of, Hey, things happen even in the 3d printing world that may throw off a timeline or two. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a machine that can break. So using a manufacturer that has more than one machine, obviously it's a good idea because if one goes down and the other one can print or whatever, but that always doesn't, that, that doesn't always happen. If you think about it, this technology and these machines I mean, what are they, Brent? Five years old? I don't know. I mean, I know they've been developing them longer than that, but th- things things do break. And you have to remember, too, that to own one of these machines, you're, you, you've got to keep it busy. So you have to pack it with builds and you have to be producing all kinds of parts. So our sockets might be mixed in with a door handle or whatever else. It's in the interest of those that own those machines, those high-end machines, to keep them busy, keep them running. So things can break. And so I have had times where, okay, I'm supposed to have a one week turnaround on my socket, whatever it is. And I've had times where it's taken two weeks. Don't think that that's much different than the regular O and P world. Sometimes I don't certainly don't think it can compete with having your own technician in house that can laminate something overnight or whatever. But for me, that's not important. I, I don't, I typically, if I need something very quickly, done very quickly, I can do that. And we do do that. And by the way, we still use regular laminations and so forth. It's, we're not 100% had, but, but, but you're right, Brent. It's, it's not perfect and it's not like the perfect world at all. I mean, things do happen. So, but that's OMP, you know. Um, when, when you were looking around for your contract manufacturer or a partner to do this stuff, I mean, what were some of the things that you looked for, the questions that you asked, or how, how did you know that you kind of landed on somebody that you could, you could work with? Well, you know, I mean, you ask the questions of how many machines you have, what's your throughput, what's your, what's your turnaround, and, you know, how do you inspect your machines and how do you clean them? I mean, obviously, I think these machines are difficult to own and and you would know better than I, Brent, but they need to be kept clean and maintenance needs to be done on them. And if it's not, you can have problems. So for me, I wasn't a scientist about it. I, I don't, you know, I don't know a ton about these machines at all. I know, I know what I know. And I, I, I know that I also tend to trust my gut on working with someone like any lab that is just responsive, that has good customer service which I've definitely found now, but I went through a few to figure that out. And so it's all those good business decisions that you have to make, but certainly quality and reproducibility and what is your plan if your machine goes down kind of thing. Those are, those are the questions you need to know besides the obvious ones of cost. These sockets are going to be as expensive, maybe more expensive, obviously more expensive than if you just laminate something in house, but then you're paying for the overhead. You could go on and on with the math and the comparisons, but you just have to be comfortable with your own process, I guess. And and do you think that, that you know, is, is 3D printing just going to be a tool we use? Is it one of them? Or is it going to be a super important tool that's going to, like every single time, expand a little bit more, a little bit more, it's going to get a little bit better and cheaper until it makes up a, a significant portion of the work that the, the, the OMP industry does? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that it's here to stay and it will continue to grow. I mean, for sure, it's 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 obviously done that quite a bit in the past 
past couple of years. You know, it's interesting because I I firmly believe that it's it's actually the the best way to teach a student. I just I just know that to be true in my head because you know the way you modify you can you can really get into say a particular region and you you know you kind of say okay from your clinical evaluation how much pressure do you want to put on this area and then you can design that in and then there's this beautiful function called undo which you know you can just undo the modification and apply it again so being able to visually do that with a student i think it's very very powerful you know i i, I feel I feel like the, the programs that teach O&P right now do a great job and with, with what they have and, and they have to teach to what's being tested. And I don't think anyway, maybe Brent, you know, but obviously there's no 3D printing or CAD on the board exams. So it's <laughs> right. <not>. No. <laughs> and you can't do a, a undo on the board exams either. <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, that's, I think that's a thing that's that's coming, but but because because it's not on the board exams, it's it's how is how is it then going to make it into a curriculum of an O and P program? It can't. I mean, no offense to any of the programs, they're doing a tremendous job teaching all the skills that students need to have. But clearly, I I think if and when that might happen, then perhaps it gets taught in the schools. I, I think that's that's going to happen. I don't just don't know when. And and as a result, what's happening is all these engineering companies are coming into our field and wanting to automate something and then have companies pay a subscription for that service. And I I for for me that's not the way to go. I, I believe again still owning the modifications and sort of doing the upfront stuff yourself as is, is the best sort of outcome for the patients. That's just kind of my thought. Okay. And how about like, how about just the market? Cause we were talking about that in the last episode. Like, do you think you seemed like before you were kind of like, you know, looking at the, 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 the insurance situation, cost rising, you seem quite somber about, you know, the independent OMP office, if you will, the small, the slash mom and pop at the small local office. Is, is, is that true? Or are you just like, Saying it's going to be a really tough world out there for 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 small independent OMP practitioners, or um, I I didn't mean to be somber about it. I mean we're, we're doing well, and I I believe there's a place for small mom and pop practices like ours. I think I enjoy the the independence of it all, and and the concept of being able to to we can invest and decide in whatever technology we want to do, and then apply it. So. I'm not saying bigger companies can't do that, but certainly at scale, I'm not sure we're there yet for Hangar or a large company to to implement these programs yet. I'm certain they're working on it, but but I think there's value for O and P. I mean, the O and P. How many? What percent of our field is small business? And I would say it's, it's quite, still quite a bit. Oh, maybe over seventy percent, or I don't know what the number is, but there's yeah, significant- I would say somewhere in there, six, sixty to seventy percent. Yeah, so that I mean that that's a big number of our field, and I I, I don't think that's going to sort of change overnight. And there are many small businesses getting into uh, CAD and three D printing through learning about it through podcasts from you guys, for example, and and lots of other social media places like Brent, your posts and everything. So I feel like there's a lot of buzz about it, and so um, I think also clinicians as they come out more and more just aren't afraid to press the keys on the computer to just try stuff. And it's natural for them. How do we not develop CAD more and, and in small businesses as well? That's incredible. So we, we were talking on the last, so the last episode was about Hanger's acquisition of SureStep and Transcend. And we talked a little bit about how the reality is, is that small business right now is it's a perfect time to be involved in this kind of this digital manufacturing age and such, because you have, I don't want to say you have less to lose, but you have less to lose, right? So because it's not a, such a big company, when you, when you try 
certain things and you can have more control over, say, a clinician that you're working with on one specific device or choosing the patients. Would would you agree, disagree with saying that it could be a, a, a true competitive advantage to a small business right now to kind of hop on the bandwagon as, at, in a time where some of the larger players are a little bit skittish and on going all in on the technology? Absolutely. I mean, it, absolutely. It just, it, it's just like anything though. You, you, I think you have to have the right sort of attitude about it and you have to have the right commitment and support from whoever owns the business to go into something. I mean, that sounds obvious and it is, but, but it really matters in CAD because it may take a while. It's going to take some money. I know that you can get into CAD cheaply by starting out and that's a way to start for sure. So it's not nearly as hard as it used to be, if that makes any sense. At least I don't think so, Brent. I mean, I, I think it's easier to get into doing it now than it was, say, five years ago, for sure. The the resources that are available are amazing. And there's, there's there is a lot of low cost options available. So you can kind of figure out, figure it out. Yeah. And, and, and also you have to, I think being smart about where you apply it matters. So the, for example, we have an expert in scoliosis and she's been doing it for many years and she's excellent at it. She's, she's one of the best in, in anywhere. And she has a process with the company that she uses for her scoli modules, which I, I don't mean to make a pitch anywhere one way or another, but so she uses that very successfully. Sometimes she might scan the 12 year old girl for the scoliosis module. And sometimes not, she just takes measurements or uses the Providence board or whatever it is. And that company produces beautiful scoliosis modules. I'm not going to apply CAD to that. Why? It's a processes that are work that work very well that when I look at it, I say, okay, I can apply CAD to that process, but it's not necessarily going to result in better quality. And it probably might not be less expensive. It might be more expensive. So I think tailoring CAD to where it makes sense within your business is critical. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good sentiment, I think. I think that's a really good to just not run, rush fully into it and do everything CAD. And, 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 but also, I think, I, think uh, I would agree that now is the time to at least investigate this. I don't know if it will work for you. It also depends on how your mind works and, and, and what you do exactly. But I think it's, it is a time to explore this. Thank you so much for being here today you're as welcome. well. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and Brent, thank you for being here as well today. Oh, this was great. And it was good to hear kind of Paul's journey. It, it, uh, kind of fill in the blanks for me. So this was great. And thank you for listening to the Prosthetics and Orthotics podcast. And have a great day. <laughs>